That was one of many classic monkey songs co-written by my guest today, Bobby Hart. We just heard the song, She. In addition to The Monkees, Bobby and his songwriting partner, Tommy Boyce, wrote hits for Little Anthony and the Imperials, Jay and the Americans, Paul Revere and the Raiders, and countless others. Boyce and Hart would go on to become successful performers themselves, and now that story, the story of that songwriting and performing partnership, is told in Bobby's new book, Psychedelic Bubblegum. Let's welcome uh, Bobby Hart back to the program. And, uh, Bobby, I have to ask about that title. Where did that title, Psychedelic Bubblegum, come from? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's talking about music. You know, that was the genre that we got lumped into, Tommy Boyce and myself, when we were producing a lot of records for very young people. So they called it Bubblegum Music. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, when we came back to Tommy had her first hits in, in New York, 1964, and uh, we got signed to Screen Gems Columbia Music, and we came back to California in 1965. Everything was changing out here, and we we would find us down at the at the Whiskey A Go Go every night, or on the Sunset Strip, or in a Love Inn somewhere. So the kind of music we were hearing out here was different than the first half of the 60s, and they were calling that psychedelic music. We go see The Doors, or Arthur Lee in Love, or The Leaves, or somebody. So I said in the book that probably that was a better handle for the type of music we were doing, psychedelic bubblegum. Sure, it was progressive music, and yet at the same time, it uh, appealed to the kids. Exactly, and we, but we put on things like, you know, Indian instruments, uh, tambours, and, and we put on uh, that feedback guitar like Jimi Hendrix was doing, and uh, it, so it was a little, little bit of a mix. Uh, Bobby, last time you were on, we were talking about the Boyce and Hart documentary, The Guys Who Wrote Them. And I know it was playing some festivals and that sort of thing. Has that been released yet? You know, it hasn't been released. It's, it's been in preview for about a year now. And uh, they'll be doing another preview at the Grammy Museum, I think. And I'll do a book signing there for Psychedelic Bubblegum. But uh, they're still looking for the money to complete the uh, licensing of some of the clips and so on. Or looking for a distributor so. Well, I'm sure that'll work itself out because there's been this renewed interest in the uh, Boyce and Hart partnership as of late. It's uh, kind of interesting that uh, serendipitous, if you will, uh, because when I was writing the book, which we started um, six years ago with my partner, Glenn, it, it, we didn't really know that the movie would be made, but it uh, turned out that way, and it's, it's kind of fun. You know, when you were on the program last summer, we talked about a slew of Boyce and Hart songs, and the one I neglected to bring up, and everyone's since reminded me of it, I neglected to bring up Last Train to Clarksville. Can you tell us anything about uh, what inspired this Monkees classic? Oh, well, that was the first Monkey single, as you know, and, uh, first their uh, first number one. It's on the charts, uh, before the show went on the air, actually, before the TV show was out. Um, it kind of had its uh, beginnings. I was pulling into my driveway, and I, had, I was flipping through the top 40 stations, as I often did, and I just heard this, the fade-out part of the new Beatles record, Paperback Writer. And I could hear them saying, and I thought he was saying, take the last... That's all I got uh-huh. out of it, and, and it was over. And I didn't get a chance to hear about hear the song, actually, in its entirety, so probably the next day when I was going into the office or something. But I had that in my mind. But take the last, it must have been take the last train somewhere. When I heard it the next day, I realized it, it wasn't about trains or the last anything. But I had, I had a title, so Tommy thought it was a good title, and we started kicking titles around of where it could be, too. And... Uh, got to Clarkdale, which is a small town northern Arizona where I used to go in the summer. And Tommy said, well, what about Clarksville? So that's that's how it started. We're talking to songwriter Bobby Hart on our Monkeys Spectacular today. And I know the Monkeys used a variety of songwriters and producers until eventually they wrote the songs and produced the albums themselves, but initially, weren't you and Tommy supposed to be the main uh, songwriters and producers? You know, uh, both of those uh, options are true. We uh, we first went over to meet with the producers of the television show, and it was just an em- embryonic stage, and 
and uh, they told us what they wanted to do, an American Beatles on television, and they needed three songs for the pilot. And uh, we convinced them we were their guys because we knew the power of combining television with, with, uh, with records. So they hired us to not only do the three songs for the, for the pilot show, but to produce the records uh, because the records that, that would be released would also be in the television show. So we worked for almost a year uh, planning this thing and writing songs and uh, really honing in on the sound that we thought was going to work. And then Donnie Kirshner, who was the head of our publishing company, never paid much attention to the project until it was sold, and then he came out finally. And he called us in one day and said, you guys, I can't let you produce these records because you don't have a track record as producers. You've written, written songs but not produced hits. Right. So we were, you can imagine, pretty crestfallen for, yeah. for a few days. But uh, we kept a good attitude, and um, a few weeks later, after Donnie had tried several of the top hottest record producers in the business, including English ones and Snuffy Garrett here and Carol King, Jerry Goff, and he, he didn't have anything that he liked, that he was, what, what they were coming up with he didn't. He didn't think it was going to be good for the first Monkey album. So we we got Donnie's ear uh, finally, and we said, Donnie, it's July now. The show's going on in September. You don't have anything to release. Here's the plan. I'll take my my band, because I was working nights in nightclubs you know, at the same time. So I said, I'll take the candy store profits in this small little rehearsal studio, and we'll rehearse We'll work up the arrangements, and you come down. It's ten dollars an hour for the studio. It'll cost you twenty bucks. If you don't like it, we'll forget about it. If you like it, then you got to give us our project back. So that's what happened. He loved it. Well, Donnie Kirshner supposedly had a golden ear, so he must have been using it that day. Yeah, <laughs> I hope it was the right one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Boyce and Hart became something of a television phenomenon, much like the monkeys, because suddenly when you became performers, you appeared on shows like I Dream of Jeannie and uh, Bewitched. How did this all come about? What, what happened was when we came, after we'd had a couple of hits in New York, Tommy and I signed with Screen Gems and came back to the West Coast. Uh, it was wonderful that, that our music publisher was owned, Baird Company was Columbia Pictures and, and Screen Gems Television. So we got sent out on a lot of movie and television projects. At the time, it didn't seem like such a big deal because we were just chasing the next hit record. That's all we knew was the charts, right? right. But uh, when you're looking back over the years, um, the songs and the music that was attached to visuals like television and movies uh, have much longer longevity than those hit records. And maybe the most famous piece of music uh, you and Tommy co-wrote was uh, the theme to Days of Our Lives. Like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. This is MacDonald Carey, and these are the days of our lives. You know, we went over and met with the producers who had had radio uh, uh, soap operas, and they were going to do this new soap opera, and, and we, uh, they told us what we wanted, and we thought we gave it to them, and they didn't like it, and we, so we tried a second time, and they didn't like it. Tommy was saying, you know, forget about this. It's right hit records. We don't, we, you know, he, he had no idea. Neither one of us had any idea they would be playing five days a week on television, you know, for 50 years. I know in the 70s that you and Tommy got into some more monkey business by uh, teaming up with Mickey Dolans and Davy Jones as Dolans, Jones, Boyce, and Hart, which was a fun little project. What, what's the story there? Well, my friend Christian DeWalden was an uh, uh, international... Uh, music publisher and concert promoter and he came back and said we want to we want to offer a gig to the monkeys uh he, he was he'd just gotten back from bangkok and, and uh, thailand so he said would you mind calling up mickey and, and tell him we want to offer them a gig mickey said that uh that michael was not interested in doing any monkeys projects at that time and they didn't even know where peter was he was kind of off the radar 
So when I told Christian, he said, well, why don't you and Tommy go out with Mickey and Davey? So we got together, the four of us, and discussed it, and we had so much fun at that lunch that we decided, well, let's, you know, if somebody wants to pay us, we'll, we'll give it a try. So while we were waiting for the Southeast Asian tour to be put together, uh, which was a year year in advance, uh, we started getting booked around domestically in this country. First uh, gig we played was Six Flags over Mid America, and twenty six thousand kids showed up. So we wow. knew we were onto something. And and you recorded some great new music too. That was Dolan's Jones Voice and Heart with It Always Hurts the Most in the Morning right here on the Vintage Rock and Pop Shop. We're wrapping up our conversation with uh, Bobby Hart. You, you know, you mentioned those tours with Mickey and Davey. They have a reputation for being kind of nuts. So <laughs> <laughs> any uh, stories from the road you can share with us? Well, there were a lot, a lot of them, but most of them I couldn't probably tell on radio. But the, <laughs> you, they... They were groomed to be crazy. They were actors. Those are the two actors. The other two were actually musicians. They right. had to become actors. Uh, the two actors had to become musicians. So it was uh, it was a stretch for all of them. But they were all encouraged by the television show producers to be zany and spontaneous and over the top and even a little rude. And so they that was their persona that they were groomed into. And uh, so when in public, you would often you would often see that kind of stuff um, come to fruition. We'd go into radio stations, and you know they'd be standing on the console and and uh, taking over the studio and screaming and yelling. And so <laughs> we kind of followed suit. Voice and heart were were like the mini monkeys in a way. We, we kind of kept that same attitude when we would go into radio stations in various towns and. And there was a lot of pandemonium and a lot of jiving. When you're writing pop songs, you have to get your message across in two minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> and uh, sitting down to write a book, I imagine, would be a very difficult experience because, you know, you're used to uh, condensing your thoughts into something uh, very, very potent. But now you have a chance to uh, expand. That was difficult for me because I had, I, I had that, I've always... Uh, had that training plus interviews like this one you want to tell the story fast because there's a limited amount of time right. so you do the punchlines in the book i had to learn from my co-writer uh, glenn valentine uh as i always have i've i partnered up with somebody makes it so much more fun than trying to sit there and stare at a blank page by yourself right so uh i had to learn how to flesh things out in the book and and paint the pictures and sh- and so you can smell the smells and feel the feelings uh, in all these stories. And, of course, for the first time, they're all told in depth and, uh, and in detail. Well, I'm sure it's a fascinating book. I'm going to be reading it myself. And, you know, with the book and the Boyce and Hart uh, documentary from last year, and I, I hate to be morbid here, but it, it's just a shame that uh, Tommy's not around to see all this. It's it's true. I, I have that feeling all the time. You know, we go do a book signing or a screening of the documentary, and invariably I will think or somebody will say, boy, Tommy would really love to have been here for this, you know, and you just think about that all the time. He went, he left us too soon, and uh, hopefully he's, he's looking down and, and appreciating it. I'm sure he is. Uh, Bobby, where can people go to get your book, Psychedelic Bubblegum? It'll be in the stores on the 12th of May, uh, but you can do a pre-order right now, anytime between now and then, uh, at Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. And, uh, in fact, if you want, uh, if you go to BobbyHart.com, uh, there's a form you can fill out and you can get a free download. Uh, if, you want, if you do uh, pre-order the book, a download of a, a voice, uh, a, I'm sorry, it's not a voice and heart song, it's a, it's a Bobby Hart uh, song that I sang from... Uh, a new musical that my, I wrote with some partners. So you can download that, and I think you'll enjoy that song, too. What is the book? Fantastic. Bobby, thanks so much for appearing on the show. Once again, the book is Psychedelic Bubblegum. And, uh, Bobby, you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for the interview. It was fun, and uh, best, best to you as well. The song was pretty white. Well, so am I. What can I tell you? You've been working on your dancing, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, I've been rehearsing it. Glad you noticed that. Yeah, it doesn't leave much time for your music. 
You should spend more time on it because the youth of America depends on you to show the way. Yeah? Yeah. Monkeys is the craziest people. We just heard Daddy's song from the Head soundtrack going out to Molly in Buffalo, who requested that one last week. And, of course, a short clip from the movie Head. And it's true. The youth of America did depend on the monkeys to show them the way. And that meant that they also depended on Ann Moses, their connection to the monkeys and just about every other pop star in the 60s via Tiger Beat magazine, where Ann was the editor. So I think it's safe to say that most young people lived vicariously through Ann. <laughs> Uh, between 1966 and uh, 1972. Ann Moses is our guest here on our Monkey Spectacular. Welcome to the show. And how does one become the editor of Tiger Beat magazine? Well, uh, it, it is a long story. I'll try and capsulize it for you. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Anaheim, California. And as a teenager um, in high school, I worked at Disneyland. And I was also a fan of um, Broadway musicals, Any Get Your Gun, Oklahoma, all those. So when they built Melody Land Theater, which is the theater in the round across the street from Disneyland, I signed on as a volunteer usher. So that was in the summer nights and weekend nights, I would go and usher people to their seats, and then I was allowed if there was an empty seat, to sit and watch the show or to stand in the back and watch the show. So I saw some amazing Broadway musicals. Mm. But one night I went to work really not knowing what was on the bill. Hadn't paid any attention. I, it was just, it was in the, it was July of 1965. And I show up and it turns out that instead of a musical, they're doing the first live rock and roll show ever been performed at Melody Land. Wow. Stars were Dave Clark. There were a couple of um, kind of surf bands. I can't remember exactly who. And then a, a couple that I was not yet aware of called Sonny and Cher. Ah. This was 1965. All of my friends had been watching the Beatles when the first picture was in Life magazine, then when they appeared on Ed Sullivan. And so we were just a part of that whole mass British invasion fangirls like crazy. <laughs> so for the first time, I see a British rock and roll band perform, and I was just blown away. And in my own mind, I said, I've got to meet these guys. So I happened to be the co-editor of my college newspaper at the time. So I went up to their manager and I said, I've been assigned to do an interview. When when can I talk to them? And he, you know, of course, he gave me this look, like rolling his eyes and, <laughs> oh, please. But at the same time, none of the huge press attention had been paid to groups like Dave Clark Five yet. And so, basically, after telling me no two or three times and me being the bulldog that I am, I said, I said, I, you know, I'd really like just five minutes with them. And, and so their manager, Rick Percone, um, their tour manager, he said, okay, come back between shows because they had a, or an early show and then they had an 8 o'clock show and they had a, about a two-hour break in between. He said, I'll, I'll give you five minutes with them, but that's it. So turns out the five minutes turned into a half an hour. I took photographs and I got a great interview with the guys. I published it in my college newspaper, mm -hmm. you know, in the enter entertainment section, and all my friends just thought I was so uncool <laughs> because it was like, well, why didn't you write about a real artist like Bob Dylan? You know, oh. What are you doing writing about these long hairs, you know? Because the male fan base hadn't really kicked in at that point, mm -hmm. and they, they did not think that was cool. I didn't care. But then I got a phone call from a local girl near the college. She and her mother were publishing a weekly music newspaper. It was four mimeographed pages, and they sold it for a nickel in the record stores all over Southern California. It was called Rhythm and News, and they essentially were focusing in on blues artists. And they said, would you like to write for us? 
you know, no money, but you'll get to go to these different shows. And I said, that sounds great. And they started sending me up to South Los Angeles, and I covered a bunch of the up-and-coming uh, black artists of the day, you mm-hmm. know, James Brown and, um, oh, I can't think of all the names now, but, you know, I was up there in the, in the little African-American clubs, and I was always so welcomed by these groups who, were, who had gotten so little attention, you know, and, until a little bit later on. So then a friend suggested to me, she says, gosh, you're doing all this writing for this, this newspaper. Why, wouldn't it be fun to get paid for it? And I said, well, it'd be great to get paid for it. <laughs> and, and she said, why don't you go to work for Tiger Beat? And I said, what's Tiger Beat? <laughs> and so I promptly went to a newsstand, bought an issue of Tiger Beat. I realized that one of the PR agents that I had gotten to know, Derek Taylor, who was formerly the the publicist for the Beatles, but right. then he moved to America and started his own PR firm. And I had worked with him on a number of stories um, where he was encouraging me to do stories on his artists like the Beach Boys and the Birds. And I saw that he wrote a monthly column in Tiger Beat. So I went to his office one afternoon and said, geez, is there any way you could get me an introduction to them? And lo and behold, he picked up the phone. He called the editorial director, Ralph Benner. He said, you know, could she come and talk to you? And he said, can you be over there in 45 minutes? And I said, absolutely. So the next thing (laughs) I knew, I was in his office, kind of didn't have any materials with me, you know, no resume, no copies of my stories. But he said, he said, well, it sounds like you've written some interesting pieces. Why don't you write a couple in Tiger Beat style and submit them to me, and we'll go from there. And so I rewrote the Dave Clark Tide story. I rewrote my James Brown story in more Tiger Beat style, which is including their favorite colors. And right. Like their, their eyes were so blue, or they were so this or so that. And, <laughs> you know, all of those little details to, to get little girls' hearts pumping. And I took them in the next Monday. That was a Friday afternoon. I took them in after school on Monday, drove up to Hollywood. And uh, he said, this is great. He says, can you, can you start working part-time during your last semester of school? And I said, absolutely. So I w- was working about several days a week. And then, then when June rolled around, they said, well, you are going to work full-time, right? And at that point, they had started sending me to Hawaii with Paul River and the Raiders and Dino, Desi, and Billy, and on tour with the Raiders and the Standell, you know, all over the country. So I was taking my first plane ride, first time out of California. You know, life just opened up to me. It was just incredible. Wow. And I guess it's safe to say that the monkeys hit at just the right time for you and your uh, tenure at Tiger Beat. Absolutely. It was was, uh, that you know, I started with them in January of 66, and their their show, show aired in September of 66. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I went on the last train to Clarksville, which is, which is a radio station promotion, the day before their show was going to air. And, uh, and they per- performed before, you know, they flew in on helicopters to the, to the renamed uh, Del Mar, California, train station had been renamed Clarksville, right. and then they performed, and then they performed on the tra- train ride back, which was awesome. Hi, Gene, we're the monkeys. Did you tell them about the TV show yet, Mike? No, man, I was going to sneak it in. you got to be very subtle about these things. You're going to tell them that we'll be on NBC TV starting September 12th at 7.30 p.m. in colors? A cool it. What's more fun than a barrel full of monkeys? Gosh, a Rooney, Mike. I don't know. What is more fun than a barrel full of monkeys? A train full of monkeys. Dig. Kane's Chase chartered the last train to Clarksville, and they're going to take hundreds of lucky listeners on a trip September the 11th. Bro. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. The KHJ happening to wrap up the summer of 66. And us monkeys want to meet you at the station in Clarksville. Yeah, each of us will give away a color TV set. So enter now. All you do is send a postcard to Monkey Trip, Box 38130, Hollywood. Starting Tuesday morning, the bus jocks draw a winner every hour, and each winner gets to bring a friend. Mail your card in and ride with the monkeys. On the last train to Clarksville. Because my publisher had seen um, the pilot, right, and he, you know, 
obviously he could tell it was going to be a huge hit. He did buy the right to to publish Monkey Spectacular magazine and have access, you know, for for Tiger Beat to the set. So from that point on, I spent about three days a week on the Monkey set, whether it was you know, outside at Columbia Ranch with them swinging on vines in Tarzan costumes <laughs> or whether they were doing their kooky stuff on, the, um, you know, the indoor set of their, their little beach house, supposed <laughs> beach house. And, and um, it, was, it was just, it was a magical time, you know, besides all the other things that was going on in music, you know, the, the Monterey Pop Festival and all these other things. But the monkeys, it was just, it was the TV show, and then once they started doing their live concerts, their live concerts were just fantastic, and I went on tour with them for a few days, and um, it, it just a great experience. Now, I would imagine that a lot of the coverage, in fact, I can see it, because obviously we can see these issues of Tiger Beat still today, yeah. and a lot of the coverage centered around Davey, which, of course, makes a lot of sense. Um, was he the one that you dealt with the most? I would say yes, for a couple of reasons. First of all, he was the favorite monkey. Right. We, we got more fan mail on him than anybody else. More, you know, he sold more covers. Um, and, but just like the Beatles, everybody had their favorite. Right. So they, they were interested in the other ones. But the second reason I seem to spend the most time with Davey is because he had been uh, a Broadway actor and performer, right? You know, experienced in the business, and he he knew what this opportunity meant, and he knew how important it was to how important the publicity was to further the success of the group of himself as a performer, and it was just in his nature to be genuinely kind and giving, and so. There was never a time that he would say, I don't have time to talk to you today, or no, you, and I don't want to come to that photo shoot. He was just always, he was a partner in, in, in you know, my job of, of getting everything possible out to, to his millions of fans. And, I mean, he just made my work a delight. <laughs> and it seems, based on reports, and he was a guest here at this radio station, <laughs> several years ago um i don't think he really changed over the years i don't i don't either in fact um when when he passed away i happened to see a youtube video um shortly after that and it had been about a week before he he passed and he had done a performance at a theater and they shot this little video backstage and these people had come backstage to ask him if they could have an autograph. He was autographing things, and then he was chatting with them, and he said, thanks so much for coming to the show. And then I can't remember what somebody else said to him, but he stood there and he did a little soft shoe tap dance. And, I mean, (laughs) he was the same Davey he was 40 years before. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. He appeared at the Mid-Atlantic Nostalgia Convention, Mm-hmm. And after he was there for a few hours, he just started giving out his autograph for free. Now, th- this is supposed to be, obviously, you're supposed to pay and have things yep. signed. And he would give it out for free. And then he started helping, um, you know, at the end of the day, he was helping other vendors and other celebrities load their trucks. Oh, my God. From all, with all of their photos and stuff that they were selling. <laughs> that's the day I knew, yeah. uh, you know, that I was privileged to know. When you're in a situation with the monkeys or Paul Revere and the Raiders or, Mm -hmm. you know, whoever, is there ever a time when you're asking a question and you know that what you're getting from them is the party line and not necessarily the truth? Well, absolutely, yes. Because Tiger Beat was not the National Enquirer, Mm -hmm. and in... In those days, it was a bit of old Hollywood had hung on to things where the, the big stars got to keep their secrets because that was to everyone's benefit. You know, whether they, whether they were gay or they were cheating on their wife, doing drugs, whatever the case may be, it's like it was to nobody's benefit 
to share that information. You know, mm. with with our with our expose shows on television today, um, that's what it's become. But at that time, it it was not entirely best interest to you know expose some of the things that I was privy to, and and uh, you know, and they felt comfortable. You know, they knew I knew things that were going on, but they were participating in a way where they could answer my questions. And I would have something to print that was from the horse's mouth. Right. But we both knew it was, you know, not black and white. Right. I mean, part of the reason I ask that question is obviously mm-hmm. there was controversy with the monkeys when it came out that they did not play on the first two records. And mm-hmm. then, of course, they gave concerts, which proved that they could play their instruments. Did they express that frustration to you? They didn't. I, I, I really wasn't aware of the behind-the-scenes going on with the music part of it, because I mostly, even though I was at one or two of their, well, I was only at one recording session where I got to clap on one of the records. Uh, <laughs> Which uh, one? You know, Do you remember? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm a believer. Oh, you're clapping on that. Yes, I am. Uh, they, they had they had already put down their tracks, the vocals, and and um, they were just adding the last little last few layers. Sure. They saw me in the hall and said, "Hey, can you come help us?" And it was like, "Yeah." So to this day, when I you know when I hear that song on the radio, I can hear myself clapping. It's pretty cool. <laughs> but I was not privy to all of the the tumultuous things that were going on between Mike and the group and their producers and all those things until I read uh, Andrew Sandoval's book, which was um, The Um, Monkeys, The Day-by-Day Story of the 60s TV Pop Sensation. And that really chronicles the the ins and outs of what they were going through on that end. And so that was my eye-opening, you know, a year or two ago. Well, you know what? As as we start to wind down here, because I'm I'm going to be running out of time with you, but I've already mm-hmm. decided that you have to come back. Okay. I, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about your upcoming book. Well, I certainly hope that it's upcoming. Uh, <laughs> I've finished the manuscript. Uh, it's a um, coming-of-age memoir. It's a memoir of the pop culture of the late 60s, early 70s, all about my time as editor of Tiger Beat. There's a, a lot of untold stories that couldn't be told in Tiger Beat at the time, mm. and um, it it just it was it was very cathartic to write it. Um, I started my blog three years ago, and that really opened my eyes because I got a number of people that would write me back and say, "When I was 12 years old, I wanted to be you," and <laughs> and and I didn't have any clue that that was going on until I I got involved in social media, and now I have a Facebook fan page, you know, Facebook forward slash Ann Moses, and I just get these amazing, well, the audience just for my fan page alone, I mean, it stretches from people that are my age back down to, you know, their kids who want to know about their parents' days Mm -hmm. of rock and roll, and just, you know, men and women, you know, people that are interested in that time. So um, I I just, we basically, we have the book out at a number of agents and a couple of publishers, and we're just waiting to to get that good word that somebody wants to to uh, bring the book out, and and so I can share it with everybody, because there, there are some funny stories, there are some, um, you know, jerking stories. Um, it, it, I think it's an interesting read. So, uh, one way or another, with with self publishing today, it's going to come out one way or another. <laughs> well, it, it it sure sounds like a, a fantastic book, and and people can just keep up with you on Facebook, it, as you mentioned. Uh, they absolutely yeah. can, and at my blog, which is annmoses.com. Thanks so much. Have a great uh, rest of your day. Oh, same to you. Bye bye. Bye bye. That's the song you heard as the closing theme to the Monkees' second season of their television show, the song For Pete's Sake, Going Out to Jeff. 
Time to welcome another guest to the program. Melanie Mitchell might be a familiar name and voice to listeners of the Zilch podcast, but she's also the author of a book called Monkey Magic. Melanie Mitchell, welcome to the show. Why, thank you so much. You know, I find this interesting, Melanie, because there are quite a few books out there about the monkeys, but most of them focus almost exclusively on their music. It, it's almost as if the television show is an afterthought. That's obviously not the way that the, the monkeys started. It was a TV show that became a band. What prompted you to write a book focusing on the TV show? Well, I didn't actually set out to write a book at all. I wanted to get involved in the fandom back in 2012. Mm-hmm. And I, I had written episode reviews of other television shows before this one. Right. So I had some experience at it. So I decided this would be a way for me to sort of stick a toe into the conversation and say, hey, let's talk about these episodes. What did you like? What didn't you like? How did it work? That sort of thing. So I took the list of episode titles and alphabetized it. Mm-hmm. I started with alias Mickey Dolan's, just to give it some variety, right. and started posting episode reviews on Tumblr. And that's how it started. So it sounds like you're relatively new to uh, Monkey's fandom. I am very new. Um, I am just barely old enough that theoretically I could have seen the show back on NBC in the 60s, but I'm pretty sure I didn't. Mm -hmm. And it was an occasional thing when I was a kid. Um, It was I think it was a Baltimore station that carried it in the late 70s, and we could just barely pull it in our TV set. So I only saw it once in a while. I knew about the music, but I wasn't into it. You know, I liked it enough, but it wasn't a really big part of my life. Um, I didn't have cable in the 80s, so I never saw it on MTV, never saw it on Nickelodeon. Did catch one concert in 1987, but I didn't really get it. Um, And then after Davy Jones died, I was curious, you know, what is it that I've missed that everyone's so upset about? So I went to the internet and fell down the monkey hole. (laughs) And I've been falling ever since. Well, now, having gone down that uh, monkey hole, why do you think this show is so fascinating to people? Well, there's the crossover between the different media, uh, television, recorded music, live concerts, the intersection between the characters and the real people. Um, that is very intriguing, and I think it's one of the reasons that people get so attached to one monkey or another, um, because there's the, you know, loving what was on the TV screen, and then there's also respecting what's real. All right, guys, now listen, this is what, we, what we've been working on. Um, see if you can pick this up, Mickey. Um, one, two, three, four. Da, 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 da. How many times did you have to watch a specific monkeys episode? Well, every monkeys episode to become a full fledged expert on the shows. <laughs> when I wanted to start working on a review, and that's what I call the individual chapters in my books or re- episode reviews, um, I would watch the episode usually at least 10 times in a row, Mm -hmm. just constantly start over, start over, start over, start over. Round about repeat number six or seven, I would start jotting down some of the easy things, like the the name of the songs and how they're used in the episode, um, nitpicks and uh, particularly good moments and things like that. And then... Around about at repeat number 10, I would start to formulate what I'd want that particular review to be about. And sometimes I'd focus on characterization. Sometimes I'd focus on a particular guest star who did an amazing job. Sometimes I'd focus on continuity with other episodes. So it's a little different for each one, but it was a lot of repeats. <laughs> you mentioned guest stars, and of course there were some very famous guest stars on The Monkees, like Rose Marie and uh, Stan Freeberg. But there were also character actors who kept popping up in in multiple roles on the show. Of course, um, Monty Landis is the best example of that. He did uh, seven episodes all in the space of two months in the spring of 1967. That's for filming. 
they were actually scattered throughout the second season, but they were all filmed as a group. Um, I've heard an interview where he said that they actually gave him the script and let him pick which character he wanted to play. Ah. Which I find absolutely amazing. Yeah, he was sort of their good luck charm, like uh, the Beatles had Victor Spinetti and uh, the Monkees had uh, Monty Landis. Uh, Melanie, can you define for us what monkey magic is? I can. As I said earlier, I saw the show a little bit when I was a kid, and in my personal categorization of television shows from my youth, I had it categorized in the same section with Bewitched and I Dream of Jeannie and The Addams Family and Nanny and the Professor and The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, shows that were about people who were involved in magical activities. And to me, the monkeys were four guys in a rock and roll band who had magical powers. That's how I perceived it. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back to the show, I was really intrigued by all these instances of magical things happening, whether it's shared imagination, where all of a sudden they're all wearing strange costumes and and involved in some fantasy sequence. Sometimes it's um, a prop appears out of nowhere. Uh, A good example is in The Devil and Peter Tork, when Mickey says the defense rests and then he immediately has a pillow in his hand. (laughs) It just appears. You know, that's something they can do. Costumes appear out of nowhere. And, of course, there's the monkey men, you know, flying around right. and things like that. So I don't, if the book is not about that, um, the title is more about just the whole fantasy, you know, joy, myst- mystique that the show has. But it also, refer- I do reference that throughout the book. Hey, Mickey, how come I have to wear all this? Because Aunt Kate said they don't like strangers in town. Besides, you look very psychedelic. Oh, (laughs) how? Well, it's the peace symbol and the beads, mostly. Come on, let's go. okay. Right, Kimasabi. What does Kimasabi mean? (laughs) Don't ask. We're talking to Melanie Mitchell, author of the book Monkey Magic. And, Melanie, I understand that you went on a spiritual quest. (laughs) <laughs> recently to see uh, Mickey Dolenz and Peter Tork in concert. And this was in Canada, right? Yeah, they're, they're, they were just this past weekend um, in the town of Orillia, which is about an hour and a half north of Toronto. Mm-hmm. I live in Maryland. Whoa. I love to drive. I love road trips. And I'd never been through that part of Pennsylvania and New York before. I'd never been north of Toronto in Ontario I met so many wonderful people um, and had such a wonderful time that I, even if I got to see them again six months from now right here at home, I'd still cherish every moment of that trip. And what did you think of the performance? It was amazing, absolutely amazing. It was so spontaneous, Mm -hmm. and there was just a lot of humor in it and a lot of joy and love. One of my favorite moments came during the acoustic set, and just the fact they did an acoustic set, that alone is, you know, enough to make yeah. it worth the price of admission. But all of a sudden, in the middle of the, the set, Mickey says, oh, by the way, you know, Peter and his band, he didn't mention the name of the band, he just said Peter and his band do this amazing arrangement of Last Train of Clarksville. Peter, will you play a little of that for us? Hmm. And Peter looked surprised, and he turned around and said something to the band. I think he was telling what key he was going to play it in. And he started playing that lick in that bluesy way that She Sway Blues does. Yeah. And he, he, he did about two verses of Clarksville when the band kind of joined in in a quiet, shuffly kind of way. And it was like, they already did Clarksville in the show. So it, was, it <laughs> clearly was spontaneous. It was amazing. <laughs> now, you, you said at the outset of this that when you decided to review these episodes and fall down the monkey hole, as you put it, uh, you were curious to uh, learn what you might have missed. Did you find what you missed? Well, the most important thing is I missed Davy Jones. Mm. Um, There's a huge sense of regret that I could have been involved all these years and I just didn't know. I have missed everything. I've missed the whole Just Us 97 reunion Mm -hmm. thing. I've Never got to see Peter perform with James Lee Stanley as the two-man band. You know, it's just, 
I'm, I try to catch up with YouTube, and I'm so grateful that people have taken the time to, to put information out there that I can see. There's a wealth of wonderful re- archival material, interviews and uh, performances and TV shows that make it a little easier for me to sort of understand what I've missed, but I do know that I've missed it. Well, for someone who feels that they missed a lot of things, you've certainly gone into this guns blazing. You know, <laughs> you've, <laughs> you've published a book, you've watched every episode of the show 12 times or more. I know you're part of the Zilch podcast, uh, doing commentary tracks for the episodes. So let's put it this way. You're making up for lost time. There's no question about that. As I said, I never intended to write a book. I was just putting this on on Tumblr. Um, It was Andrew Hickey who wrote the book Monkey Music Mm -hmm. who suggested I turn it into a book, and I resisted. I was like, no, why would anybody pay to read what I put on the Internet for free? And he talked me into it. Basically, I realized if I didn't at least try, I would never know if I could have succeeded. True. So I made it a personal challenge to myself to try, and it actually happened. So why don't we give listeners the opportunity to find out for themselves what this book is all about? Where would people go to get it? Uh, It is available through Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com, both as a physical paperback and as an ebook for your Kindle or your Nook. And you can also buy it from um, iBooks, I think it's called, for your iPad. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a site called Smashwords. Pretty much any site that sells electronic books, you can get it there. But for a physical book, you'd have to go to either Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com. One final question for you. Do you have a favorite monkey song? A favorite monkey song? Oh, you put me on the spot. And I should have anticipated that. <laughs> oh dear. Well, I'm. I'm. Is it okay for me to pick something from Just Us? Sure, of course. Okay, because I know that's not in your your show's usual wheelhouse. But there's a song that Peter wrote called "I Believe You" that has this jazzy piano thing, and there's this chord that all four of them sing, um, where they're just going whoa, 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 and my knees un- unlock. <laughs> and I get all wobbly every time they sing that. I love that song. Once again, the book is called Monkey Magic, and we've been talking to the author, Melanie Mitchell. Melanie, thanks so much for being on our Monkey Spectacular. Well, thank you. That song was going out to Michael, the monkeys with Going Down, right here on the Vintage Rock and Pop Shop. Jody Ritson joins us again. You know her best as one of the co organizers of the Monkeys Conventions. And she's been on the show uh, a a number of times. You know, Jody, there's a strange phenomenon that happens when you're on the show. I I hear from listeners who swear that they recognize your voice and they went to high school with you. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Okay. (laughs) It's a strange thing, you know, but uh, it's true. Um, We have a lot to talk about here. But first up, last weekend... Mike Nesmith was at the Chiller Convention in Parsippany, New Jersey, and he doesn't do these types of events. I mean, he doesn't do uh, meet and greets and photo ops and that sort of thing. You were there with him. Uh, Tell us all about it. Yeah, you know, autograph shows were never his thing. Mm -hmm. And I actually, you know, he agreed to do Chiller, which gets all the celebrities from all the different walks of life And we were really excited when he said that he would do it. We were really surprised, very excited, and so was a lot of people. Um, We had people travel from all over the world. And I knew so many of these people. I knew what this meant to them because, you know, we correspond on Facebook. Anybody that follows me on Facebook knows that I get back to them. I respond to them. I take all of their stories, their questions, everything very seriously because I know how much a lot of this means to them. And I cannot even express enough how this guy did not disappoint for a second. He was just the most humble, the most class act I have ever had the opportunity to work with. And I've told you before, you know, I've met a lot of celebrities at this point, and 
I've never really been disappointed by a celebrity, Mm -hmm. but I've been very surprised by celebrities. And this guy, he took his time with everybody. He listened to their stories. He was just so amazing. So we go upstairs because he had a break. He was going to get ready to take um, some professional photo ops um, upstairs on the third floor. And so we're getting ready and we're, we're in his room and he's kind of like chilling out and he's telling me a funny story um, as he's combing his hair. And I said to him, okay, here's the first question I have. Cause see, my husband told me I'm not like allowed to act like a fan, you know, even though that's <laughs> like what I'm dying to do. He's like, dude, you got to grow up. I said to him, you didn't do this for almost 50 years. I said, but I'm watching you. And yes, I can't understand how somebody could go from being so out of touch with everybody and to have the personality, the patience and the, and just everything that you are giving to these people. Like, you know, that's a seasoned person who knows how to sit there, who knows how long to listen. This guy sat there. I kid you not. You know, oh, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Where would you like me to sign it? What angle would you like me to sign it on? What color pen would you like to choose from? (laughs) This color pen might look better. This was every single person. It was incredible. And to the point where he had to be told to speed it up because he was spending that much time with everybody. (laughs) So I said, why now? And so his response to me was, you know what, Jody, when I was at the Monkees convention, I saw something. He said, you got to understand, I don't collect anything. I don't collect anything. I'm not a collector. So when people would approach me about autographs or or any of this stuff, it didn't resonate with me. He said, I went to the convention and I saw something. You got to look in people's eyes. You got to make eye contact with them. He said, and when you make eye contact with them and you see how important this is, meeting is for them. If this could make people happy, okay, you know, it, it, then, right. then I understand. He didn't understand the collecting part and still does not, but he understands when something means something to somebody else on such a level. And all I kept thinking from that moment, from Friday night, I kept thinking, I have to collect these memories because I have to share these with everybody that follows me on Facebook because I want them to see the person that I see. And the person that I see is not the person that so many people have tried to describe, or at least he's not now. You know, very difficult, very, you know, very self-centered, you know, doesn't want to be a part of the monkeys. Everybody does things for different reasons. And so I sent Nez an email on Monday, you know, telling him what I, what I I get all choked up, what I realized this week by this weekend, by being with him for a couple of days is that I think for me, I'm never personally going to be very wealthy. But what I think I've learned from the monkeys fans is that if I'm wealthy in heart instead of pocket, I think that's really all I need And perhaps that's why I keep going the extra mile and spending the time with the people. Because to me, there is so much more that I'm getting out of seeing these people happy and excited. I mean, this guy was so amazing. I just only hope that I have the opportunity to work with him again. Because this was not work. This was every person that came and met him just left just shocked and surprised and just he made everybody's dream come true. It was really beautiful to see. Well, it sounds like an incredible weekend, and it sort of dovetails into uh, our next little topic here. Uh, I know that uh, Mike Nesmith is not uh, doing any touring at all, solo, monkeys, nothing this year. Um, Okay, and I want to, let me establish, I'm going to tell you exactly why that is. What happened was, Nez wanted, this is some inside information, Nez did not want to just go, he he felt that the monkeys should take a break and save up for the 50th, Um, you know, take the year off 
right. because people need to save money. People need to travel, you know, the excitement and retool the entire show. He did not feel that right now to go to the same venues, the same areas, the same show, he felt that it needed to be special and it needed to wait. He's writing a book right now. So he just, you know, he just felt that it should wait. Not because he's fighting with anybody. I mean, I read all sorts of stuff on sure. Facebook and I try to keep kind of, you know, out of out of the political stuff. But people really do not know what they're talking about. Um, it's only because they were just like at certain venues. So to go revisit them, you know, a year later, he felt it needed to be redone, retooled, and something special for the 50th. Now, whether he's doing the 50th or not, I didn't ask him any questions about that kind of stuff. Um, but that was why he decided to sit out, not that he will never do it again. Right. And I know that Mickey and Peter are touring and doing little shows here and there. They're not doing a full-scale tour, but uh, they do yeah. have a show in August at, at Westbury, and you're organizing something uh, for that, too, aren't you? Yeah, what I'm doing is when I found out that they were going to be in Westbury, um, as the dates keep coming up, I do these bus trips. Um, I do the bus trips for a couple of reasons. First of all, we leave out of Meadowlands um, Hilton parking lot, and that's just because that's where the convention is. And I just feel very comfortable there. I feel like everybody knows how to get there at this point. So we have a couple of um, bus trips that are coming up. Three in July, Mickey is doing um, a show in New York at 54 Below. Right. It's called A Little Bit Broadway, A Little Bit Rock and Roll. And it's a cabaret show. It's only about 150 people in the audience. And the show itself is um, going to mix some of the Broadway tunes that he's done before, some that he's never done before, certainly not for the Monkees crowd, and then some of the Monkees um, songs as well. And that's July 7th, July 10th, July 11th. And I have a bus that's going to and from. And anybody that books, through Monkeys Convention 2016.com, they get to meet Mickey and get a free autograph, and they are part of a group picture that is just our traditional thing that we do at this point. And then August 29th um, in Westbury, we're doing the same thing. We're going to leave from the uh, from the Meadowlands, uh, from the Hilton there, and we're going to travel to Westbury together. Those tickets are also available. The only difference is, as of right now, there's no meet and greet that is scheduled. Um, believe me, I'm working on it. But right <laughs> now, there's nothing that's scheduled. Um, but I only have 28 seats on the buses, and we all meet, we all have fun. And so all of that's available on monkeysconvention2016.com. And then if that's not enough for you... Here comes the boat. <laughs> <laughs> the love I boat. Yeah. I have I have to actually get my new flyers out. Um, we have a um, the convention, not really convention, but my 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 friends that I've met through the convention. We are going on a flower power cruise, February 29th to March 5th, and that is of 2016. Now, this ship is leaving from Fort Lauderdale, and Mickey is hosting the whole cruise. For five days, we're going to Cosmo, Mexico, and we're going to Key West. It's a celebrity cruise line. For the entire week, we're hanging out with Mickey. We're hanging out with Felix Cavalieri, with the Rascals, mm -hmm. with uh, Peter Noon from Herman's Hermits, the Guess Who, the Grass Roots. Jefferson Starship, Mark Lindsay, Gary Puckett, Flo and Eddie from the Turtles. Abbey Road on the River is um, a like a group that does Beatles-type yes. stuff. Blood, Sweat, and Tears with my favorite American idol, Bo Bice, is their lead singer. Mm -hmm. And Cersei Link and Christian Nesmith, who have done our Monkeys conventions. And I'm so excited because they are going to um, be on the cruise and so many more people are being added, um, but all the information is on the website. And we already have um, close to half the ship, Monkeys fans, 
I mean, they're coming out in droves. We They just gave everybody a discount on the cruise because so many people from the Monkees Convention have agreed to go on the cruise. So they went and backtracked and gave everybody discounts. And um, anybody coming on, it's actually less money than it was um, because we took over, as we <laughs> usually do. <laughs> so once again, that website is Monkeys Convention. 2016.com. Jody Ritson has been our guest, and for all of you listening in Queens and the Bronx and in northern New Jersey and parts unknown, Jody would have had to have gone to every high school in the tri state area, so she did not go to high school with you. Oh, you did not. I know that I have a little bit of a mixed accent, but I'm actually <laughs> I'm from Philadelphia, and I went to school in Philadelphia. I married my high school sweetheart. So, no, I, but, but a lot of people I know are from New York, so that's why a lot of people tend to think my accent is kind of all over the place. I, see, but, I th- um, uh, yeah, I think that every high school had a monkey girl, and I think that's what it is. I think that it's got to be the girl in my high school that was into I'm the, the monkeys. Marsha Brady. You are. <laughs> <laughs> she was the one that started it, you know? That's right. I mean, you know, the only difference is that I had to take my husband, well, he's not my husband, but I took him to the prom instead of Davey. <laughs> right. But, you know, if I had the opportunity, I'll tell you what. You would have kicked probably the husband to the curb, right. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jody, and you have a great rest of your day. You too. <laughs> All right, bye-bye. Bye. We just heard A Man Without a Dream from the Monkees' 1969 album, Instant Replay, which happens to be the album we're going to be discussing this hour with Monkees podcaster, expert, and poet laureate of all things Raybert, Ken Mills, who I also consider a friend. Ken, uh, I'll just set the scene here. I bought this record uh, sometime in the late 80s, early 90s, after the Monkees catalog had all come out on Rhino. I bought it on cassette, and until that time, I had only had Greatest Hits records. Right. And I thought one day, I'm in the mood for the Monkees. Uh, maybe I'll go to a store and see if they have some used Monkees cassettes, and there it was, instant replay. The, the fact that Peter wasn't on the cover didn't even register with me. I just knew it was a Monkees album. I'd never heard a full album all the way through. So I picked it up and uh, put it in my car, and I was driving around. And considering at least half of the tracks on here are leftovers from previous albums, this is almost like the Monkees sampler platter. And I thought to myself, boy, if the rest of their studio albums are as good as this one, I need to go collect them all, which eventually I did. So Instant Replay was sort of my gateway monkey's drug. Yeah. Uh, Ken, what's your story with this album? Well, it's kind of uh, totally the opposite of what you went through. Mm-hmm. I actually went through a thing where I kind of refused to listen to the album. I never really <laughs> listened to it properly. I never really gave it its due because Peter Tork was not part of it. Right. So I didn't really want to take part in it. And uh, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> because it went from being an album that I did not value at all to becoming one of my favorites. Mm. You know, there's a theory out there in monkeydom that uh, Mike Nesmith and Peter Tork were engaged in a musical power struggle. And once Peter was out of the band, this was going to give Mike free reign to lord over the group and make them record uh, his material primarily. And that theory is not borne out on this record or the album after it, Monkeys Present. No, absolutely not. I think that what it was is that Peter Tork had this idea that they finally became a band. Why are we going backwards? Right. And Mike did not want to go backwards. Mike Mike wanted to go a different direction, but he also didn't want to be shackled to the myth of what a band was. Right. I, I know that we all saw the monkeys on TV, and we all saw the Beatles and Help where they all lived in one house with different doors and one big room. But that's not reality. And the same goes in the recording studio. When you think about what the monkeys were and became, they were more like the Beatles were around the White Album time. Whereas you had four solo albums being made and putting it out as one thing. Right. And Peter Tork didn't really want to do that. 
And he was kind of languishing in a way in his attempts. He was getting lost in his studio work. As a matter of fact, he wasn't the only one. I think Mickey's kind of lost in the studio. Yeah, on yeah. This one. Um, uh, Mickey steps into some weird stuff on this album. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, Shorty Blackwell <laughs> might be one of the weirdest <laughs> songs in the entire catalog. Whether you love it or hate it, it is one of the most bizarre tracks that you will hear. But uh, it's weird when you look at when this album is claimed to have been recorded. It's from July 1966 to January 69. Yeah. That's a <laughs> 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 and it was released uh, February 15th, 1969. So from January to the 15th <laughs> of February, boy, they chucked that thing right out there. <laughs> right. It's interesting that the monkey who comes off the strongest here, or has the most material, just in terms of vocals, is Davey. He seems to be the dominant presence on this album. Well, you know, the weird thing is is that you kind of write Davey off in a way. Because, oh, he's going to sing the cute, you know, song like Tally Ho and all that, you know, that <laughs> sort of... The, you know, the, the British guy, you know, he's going to do his shtick. Well, Davey steps up. And he does some amazing stuff, and to me, he writes one of the most amazing analytical songs yep. of the whole pop, rock star, pop star uh, phenomena in the song You and I, which was written by Bill Chadwick and David Jones. And Neil Young plays guitar on that track. Yeah. But the lyrics are about how fickle teen stardom is, and he literally says, we're going to be replaced. Yeah. And for a band that was, you know, prefabricated or prefab for, you know, with no philosophies, he's really laying it on the line and saying, look, our, our time is almost up. Just a great song, one of Davey's best. And I think Mike steps up to the plate, too. Absolutely. Yeah. And whereas he flirted with country... He really hits yeah. it on Don't Wait For Me. <laughs> yeah, he sure does. That song is flat-out country. There's there's no pretense, there's no possibility of that being a rock tune in any way. Whereas like Papa Jean's Blues or Sunny Girlfriend had some sort of, you know... Pop sensibility, yeah. Yeah. This, this is straight-up country. What's strange, though, is weren't they on the Johnny Cash show around this time? Yes. And they, they sang Nine Times Blue, which is another incredible cut. Uh, incredible. They, they, they went on to and promoted that song, which is not on this album. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Kind of weird. It's almost like the monkeys themselves, because they're so scattered, you know, one's working in this studio, one's in the other, that they don't even realize what's coming out. And we should mention, just for the benefit of the audience that might not know the context, this is the album that comes out after Head. And if you want to, you know, go even further, forget Head. This came out after 33 and a third. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I'm look, I love the Monkees. I do the Monkees podcast. I love the Monkees, but that show is a tough sell. Do you yeah. <laughs> think that Head is something that it's hard to experience? I think that out of an hour-long show that ran on air, yeah. if you take the commercials out, you could probably get a get a good solid 10 minutes worth of material <laughs> and that's being kind. Okay. all right so yeah let's let's move on and uh, start going through the tracks here we open with uh, a boys and heart number one of several on this album this album's like the return of boys and heart to the monkeys family through the looking glass which is uh, you know sort of a cute psychedelic uh, number Maybe in the vein of something like uh, Your Mother Should Know? or Yes, and funny you mention that. We'll get to that song later. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I like how it starts off. It's got a little trumpet kind of thing it, it's, and with a keyboard, and it's, it's almost announcing the album's arrival. Yeah. You know, here we go through the looking glass. And we go through that looking glass into another Boyce and Hart song. This one, Don't Listen to Linda, featuring Davey on lead vocals. You know, it's kind of weird because Boyce and Hart went through a little roller coaster ride with the monkeys. Yeah. When you think about it, when uh, Schneider and Rafelson hired them, they said, okay, you guys are the guys who are going to do the music. Enter Donnie Kirshner. You guys are out now. Yeah. And he listens to them and says, okay, you're back on. And then it 
came to the point where the headquarters revolution happened. Okay, you guys are gone now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> then it came time to do this, and guess what? You're back with the monkeys. And they just kept bouncing in and out of the monkeys' consciousness and story, if you will. Yeah, and, and this was a song that was uh, initially cut in 1967 and then mm-hmm. again in 1968 and eventually released on this right. album. <laughs> now, this is one of the songs that when I said that, you know, you, you kind of knew what what to expect from Davy Jones, this is one of those songs. Right. So it kind of falls flat for me. Out of all the songs on this album, this is the one that kind of falls flat. But, you know, the original version is almost more of a Davy Jones. Uh, yes. You know, the original take is down, listen to Linda. <laughs> exactly. This exactly. one's more, it's it's slowed down, it's it's a little more lush. You know, I, I like it. I I, I don't uh-huh. pass it by. But the the song that's up next is one of my all time favorite monkeys recordings ever. Mine too. Now, and I it's, never it's, would have thought, but my God, what a great song! I was uh, going through a terrible, terrible breakup when I first got this record, and I I heard this song, and it's a Goffin and King song called "I Won't Be the Same Without Her." This song has a really good groove. It. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's got a funkiness to it, and I love it. I love it. I just love it. A song recorded in 1966 and inexplicably passed over, but eventually released on the Monkees' instant replay album of 1969. Ken Mills, host of the Zilch podcast, is our guest this hour as we talk about the instant replay record. And uh, Ken, up next, we have a Mickey song, Just a Game. This, well, I mean, it's pleasant, you know. This just seems very experimental to me. Yeah, but that I think a lot of Mickey's stuff at this point is him experimenting in the studio. You know, this is after he had seen, you know, met the Beatles and been in uh, Abbey Road with the guys. And, and I think he was really trying to become everything that you read about in the teen mags, you know, that they were pop stars. I think Mickey really wanted... To stretch and see what he could do, as Davy did and yeah. Mike, you know, and Peter. You know, Peter got lost uh, recording ten thousand different versions of Ladies Baby. So, <laughs> yeah. God bless him. Uh, just a game goes back to the Headquarters album. So, if you like the music on Headquarters, you might want to give Instant Replay another spin. Then we get to I, we mentioned your mother should know. Yeah, uh, we get to Me Without You, which is essentially a Boyce and Hart rewrite almost Mm -hmm. of your mother should know but i love it because nobody can sell these kind of songs like davy there's something genuine about it maybe because you know he is that guy from england who would be just as home on the music hall stage as he would in front of a rock and roll crowd yeah but even though it's davy being a little bit cheeky it's more grown up than like what we dealt with with the second track don't listen to linda It's almost a little bit of an evolution towards what's to come. Then we get to the last track on side one, and it's the very first Mike Nesmith written song on the album, and it's certainly worth the wait. Ironically, it's called Don't Wait For Me, but you should, (laughs) (laughs) because it is worth the wait, and this is, in my mind, this is classic Nesmith. And it does not get any more country than this. Yeah. As my wife would say, green is grass. That was the Your Mother Should Know-esque song on Instant Replay that uh, Ken Mills and myself were discussing before the break. Ken Mills, of course, famed Monkeys podcaster, known affectionately as the Podfather, joins me as we go track by track here. We're on side two of the album, and we've already talked about You and I, and that takes us to another beautiful ballad, courtesy of Mike Nesmith, called While I Cry. And this one is, well, similar to uh, Nine Times Blue, which is not on this record, and maybe that's why. Well, did you know that Davey also cut Nine Times Blue? Yes. That is, that, that is weird to hear that, you know, because that song, to me, seems so personal from Mike's story, from Mike's real life. And to have Davey sing it after all this time, to hear it on that handmade set, it's, it's just absolutely amazing. Yeah, we'll have to talk a little bit about that at the end of this. And uh, the next cut up is the first single from the record, Teardrop City. 
And that was one of the songs taken from the vault. And we, you mentioned Bobby Hart and Tommy Boyce's contributions. They're all over this album. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a few songs by them. And Teardrop City is one of them. And it sounds so much like uh, Last Train to Clarksville. It's <laughs> yeah. kind of bizarre. And it's weird because they took that song and they sped it up around 9% from its original recording. And they changed the song's key from G to A flat. And it became somewhat a hit for them. It reached number 34 in Australia and only 56 on the U.S. charts here. And actually, the album only charted uh, at number 32 in the top 40 album charts. So, We should also mention that Teardrop City was previously available on the back of a cereal box. Yes. <laughs> prior to it being on this, on this album. Could you imagine doing that now? You get an MP3 with the cereal box. It's just, it's not, it's not, cool. not the same. It's not, not the same. Cool. But I could never, when, when I had those cereal box records, I, I, sometimes you'd put the, the needle on, depending on the weight of the, yeah. the arm of the needle, <laughs> and it would like actually hold the record in place, so you'd have to try to yes. figure out a way to get it to play. I have a couple of Bridget Bardot records. Well, we won't go into I'll that. I'll bet but yeah. you do, <laughs> But uh, what do you think of this song as a single? I, I think it's a poor choice for a single. One, because it was kind of already a single on the back of a Cheerios box. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I get the idea of why they did this, because Head was considered so weird. Uh, 33 and a third didn't do them any favors. And releasing this song is almost like saying, hey, there's still the monkeys you used to love. Doesn't right. this sound like Last Train to Clarksville? I mean, mm-hmm. it's still those guys. It's a mistake. I, I think in the climate of 1969, there was really no place right. for a, a teardrop city. There is a performance of this, along with uh, a, a medley of Monkey songs on the Glen Campbell Good Time Hour. Yes. That you can find on YouTube. And it's interesting in that when the monkeys start playing after uh, Glen Campbell introduces them and, and and he takes the time to say how what a professional act they are well he would know he played on so many of their records <laughs> exactly but it's weird when you watch ed sullivan and all the hosts of the day they would always stress that these are really good kids folks they're really professional yeah. they're really well groomed <laughs> and nice and they showed up on time and they're punctual they don't <laughs> spit they don't chew their gum with their mouth open but anyway he goes he goes to great pains to say what a professional act they are and uh, and then he introduces them, and then the band plays live. Davey right. on bass, Mike on guitar, and Mickey on drums, and they do a medley of monkey songs. Salesman and Last Train at Clarksville. But then when it comes time to perform Teardrop City, they lip sync to it. Right. <laughs> and Mickey goofs around like he always did. Yeah. Letting you know that he knows that he's lip syncing. Yeah. I wonder what the decision was for that. They just... Well, I kind of wonder if it has anything to do with the fact that you had to uh, speed yourself up 9%. And oh, yeah, from maybe. A G to an A flat. Yeah. Then we get to The Girl I Left Behind Me. Once again, Davy Jones on lead vocals, and I, he, he dominates this record with, with, on lead vocals. Absolutely. And this song's written by Carol Beresager and Neil Sedaka. Yeah. And again, another kind of, uh, uh, like, I could almost hear Sinatra singing this song, because lyrically it's about a guy looking back at the girl he left behind in his quest for his life, and yeah. it's kind of sad. And speaking of hearing Sinatra sing a song, mm-hmm. uh, the next cut, A Man Without a Dream, which we played at the uh, very beginning of this hour, and that was going out to Scott, who requested that over on our Facebook page. Look for the vintage rock and pop shop, like it, live it, love it. Another example of what I guess Davey would call Broadway rock, great song, and then we move on to our final song on this album. And I'll just say this up front. Uh, I am not a fan. Of short, of Shorty Blackwell, um, I I don't hate it. I appreciate it for the experiment that it is. I like it when bands step out of their wheelhouse. 
there was such a weirdness in the musical climate and that people were really trying to find different voices and new ways of doing things, whether it's a guy like Jimi Hendrix on guitar or Mickey going, ah, yep. <laughs> so, you know, you that, that part does kind of swing. Yeah, I will say that. It does. Um, obviously, we're going to have to end this by playing Shorty Blackwell, but uh, just to wrap up, I kind of wish that the monkeys had convinced Peter to stick around for just a few more months because this album could have benefited from some of Peter's great material that he had been recording that hadn't been released at the time, like Come On In and Ladies Baby and Tear the Top Right Off My Head. And it's sad that Peter Tork did decide to to bolt at this time because he could have really stepped up and had a spot. Whereas he might have not been given that spot before, here his pathway could have been made clear. Yeah. One thing I'd like to mention is Rhino does these things called handmade sets, and there is an instant replay handmade set that will blow any Monkees fan's mind if they get this. It is definitely worth picking up. You get the original album, and altogether you get 89 tracks Wow. And out of those 89 tracks, you get a 45 that has two songs on it with alternative mixes of I Go Ape and I Privy, I, I Privy <laughs> do, do Not Ask for Love from the 33 and a third special. Right. But you have all the stereo mixes, all the mono mixes, and then you have things like different versions and different uh, recordings. Plus, there's a lot of great songs on there that could have made this album as well. So... To me, I've almost made up my own version of Instant Replay. Uh, Ken, for the benefit of the audience who does not know about where they can hear the Zilch podcast, where discussions like the ones we just had are plentiful, where mm-hmm. would they go to find that information? Well, you can go on iTunes or do a search for Zilch, a monkey's podcast, and we will appear like Genie. And uh, you can find us on Facebook as well. Just do a search for Zilch and we will pop up. All right, Ken, thanks so much. Thank you, sir.